If you got a Bible, grab it and uh, turn with me tonight uh, to page two of your scripture. Um, tonight, um, if it's okay with you, uh, tonight's message is, is really near and dear to my heart. And uh, I'll, I'll be very upfront with you. This will probably not be super polished. But the reason this is so near and dear is because tonight I, I kind of want to share um, the sum of the last 12 months of my journal entries, if you will. And it's connected to kind of my road towards healing over the course of the past year. And uh, I hope and pray that tonight this would speak really loud and clear to many of you. And that maybe tonight, maybe tonight some of you would get invited into the first steps in the process of healing. And that many of you might get invited into deeper waters than you ever thought possible. And you might get invited into a much bigger story. So I wanna pray and then we'll dive in. So Jesus, in these next few moments. Father, I really pray that you would I mean, just connect my heart so deeply to yours that every word is in alignment with your heart. Father, you know what every one of these students needs tonight. And one thing I know for certain is not a single one of them need me. They don't need my stories. They don't need my jokes, my thoughts on your scripture or a magic trick. Father, what these students, what I need tonight, Jesus, is I need to hear from you. I need you to speak loud and clear. I need you to speak to me and to them in, in a language that our hearts can receive and understand. And so, Father, I just pray you would speak. Like really clearly tonight. And maybe be so gracious to use me in the process. We love you. We trust you. And let me pray. Amen. Well, uh, you don't have to do Google searching for very long uh, before you quickly uh, realize that um, there are a lot of common dreams that many of us share in this space. And uh, there are three of the most common dreams. I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, any, just by curiosity, any guesses of like what are the most like common dreams? Just throw some at me, participate. Yeah, say it out loud. Like naked, naked, yeah, yeah. Yes, that will be number three. Uh, anyone else? Naked, so that's good, yeah. What else? Falling. Falling, very popular. Not in the... Websites that I looked at, and I was very selective. So, uh, but yes, that is one. Falling. What else? Drowning. Drowning. Okay. Yeah. What else? One more. Maybe give one more. Say it. Snakes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the three most popular dreams are this: are dreams about snakes, uh, which many people say that it has to deal with like the fear of the unknown. Uh, the second one. Anyone said this that I heard? Maybe you said it. Uh, with dreams about your teeth falling out. Have anybody had that dream before? Yeah, you have. So excited. I love it. Um, and typically that has to do with vanity. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, the third is dreams about being naked is what you, like you mentioned. Like, and I, have you guys had this dream? You know where you're like, you imagine that you're back in your high school and all of a sudden the bell rings and you look down and you don't have pants on. You know what I'm talking about? You can't run anywhere. Got it? Yes? No? Some of you, some of you are with me. Okay, now here's the deal. Dream experts, if that's what I will call them, say that in most cases, that the dream of being naked in your dreams could reveal a struggle with imposter syndrome, uh, a fear of vulnerability or embarrassment, and feelings of deep insecurity and shame. What's the point? Um, Here's, here's the reason I, I kind of start with that tonight. My entire life has been marked by an overwhelming sense of shame. And I've coped with it by trying to prove myself by being the best in my field or being successful, whatever that means, striving to always accomplish and constant people pleasing. Even tonight, I'm just gonna be very honest with you. 
there is a real tension as I'm sitting over here trying to worship where like I, I, I desperately step into this moment wanting you to like me, wanting you to somehow approve of me. And if I'm not careful, I let that desire and that need kind of step into the way of me just I mean, speaking what God has placed on my heart. And I would almost rather you walk away and be like, dang, Drew's, that trick, that was impressive. More than maybe I even want you to walk away tonight having your life changed by God speaking to your heart. Like that's a real tension. And it all kind of stems because of this deep toxic shame in my life. And what's crazy is I don't think I'm alone tonight. I think that the vast majority of us here in this space have a deep seated fear of being vulnerable. We deal with paralyzing insecurity or social anxiety or chronic people pleasing and the root of all of it is shame. And tonight, like I said earlier, I believe for many of you, God wants to start the process of healing. He wants to invite us into something so much deeper. So Genesis chapter two is what we're gonna to talk tonight. But first, as you, if you're not there yet, I wanna kind of set the stage uh, just in case maybe you're kind of new to this whole Jesus thing. But in the opening pages of this book, we meet a God who is, is very clear in wanting to paint the picture and let us know who he is, that he is a God that steps into this unlivable chaos of our world and he creates order and beauty so that we can like flourish and actually enjoy him. Like that's the story uh, on page one, that God creates a beautiful world marked by abundance and beauty and the fullness of life that's offered to you and I. And then God lovingly and generously creates humanity to walk in a deep intimacy of relationship and to partner with him. And Mankind on page two experiences intimacy, perfect intimacy with the God that created them to know them and love them. And they experience perfect intimacy with each other. And I think it may be one of the most intriguing verses in all scripture. Uh, In chapter two, verse 25, it, it reads this, it says this. It says that both the man and his wife were naked and yet felt no shame. So Adam and Eve, they're they're completely naked, but yet they feel no shame. What does that even mean? Like how, can we be honest? If like you actually like read the scripture, asking questions, look at this, like you you get to that verse, that's a little odd. That's a little weird. What's trying to be communicated to me? Well, ultimately what, what, what the author is, is trying to show us is that this imagery of Adam and Eve being naked and feeling no sh- shame means that they were completely, completely transparent with one another, completely honest with who they were. There's no hiding, they're fully exposed. All of their insecurities, all of their blemishes on full display and no shame, no disdain. No embarrassment, no body shaming, no comparison, no pretending, no performing. And here's what I think the author was trying to communicate, that humanity is hardwired so that we get our worth, our value, our identity and our purpose and security all from God. And when we're connected to that source, When that relationship is so strong, that love so pure, that Adam and Eve felt no insecurity at all. So much so they walk around naked and they don't even care about it. And nakedness symbolized their true and authentic selves. They were who they were and they were okay with it. There was nothing to hide. Their relationship with God was good, which led to their relationship with others being good, which led to security and confidence in the way that they see themselves. And I want you just to see the order of that. That they this relationship with God, it's good, and then which affected the way they saw each other, which ultimately affected the way they saw themselves. 
But if you've been around uh, the Jesus story for long, you see that we don't make it far into the book, page three, uh, before we choose to not trust this love and instead believe a lie and choose not to trust God. We choose not to trust the story that he's writing. So humanity steps out of bounds and they eat from the tree of knowing good and bad. The one thing that they're told not to do. They're given thousands of yeses, one no. And they choose the one no. Ultimately looking at God and saying, hey, listen, I I know you're writing the story. I know that you're in control, but I've been on earth for a little bit and I think maybe I know what's best. And so they kind of give him the proverbial middle finger and say, hey, thank you, but no thanks. I want to be the captain. And I want you to think about this. If you've ever read this story before, what was the first thing that happened after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowing good and bad? Or actually, let me ask it this way. What do you think should have happened? If all of a sudden you're given this tree of knowing good and bad and you eat it, what do you think would happen? Logically, what makes sense? Hey, you can participate. What do you think? They want some clothes. Okay, that's actually what happens, but not what you would think would happen. That doesn't make, like, wait, like, what do you think would happen? They die. die. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, okay, let's, it, this is tree of knowledge. Yeah, they, they would become maybe all-knowing. Or maybe all of a sudden they'd gain wisdom and clarity, right? Like, they, all of a sudden they know college algebra. All of a sudden now they can kind of decipher between these, like, moral ethics But that's not what the story says. Instead, the first thing that they notice, verse seven, is this. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. The first thing they noticed was they're naked. What? Like, hey, listen, if if you don't read that and go, hey, that's weird. Then, 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 hey, you, you've been around Christian culture way too long and you're becoming inoculated to the story. Every Jewish reader would have been like, what? That's strange. That's not what we anticipated. That, that's not what you're telegraphing here. What do you mean? They eat it and all of a sudden they look down and they notice that they're naked. What is that? What's going on? And what do you think? Adam and Eve, they're not trusting the story that God's writing. They're not trusting God. And the moment that that relationship here is broken by their treason against this high king, they knew it instantly. All of their worth, the security that came from God was gone. That their mistrust led to insecurity and shame. Their eyes shifted from Jesus and landed on themselves. And for the first time in human history, that we became conscious of self or self-conscious. Which also fractured the relationship that they had with each other that led them to isolate themselves, to protect themselves, cover themselves up. It also led to a feeling of disconnection from God that led to them running from God. They realized they were naked They became self-conscious and for the first time, humanity turned their focus away from God, turns it on themselves. And all of a sudden, they feel disconnection and they feel shame. They feel the need to cover up and hide parts of themselves. And in an instant, don't miss this, shame comes crashing into the human heart like a freight train. I've heard it said this way, That shame is to believe that one's being, like your essence, is flawed. That one is defective. And once shame connects to one's identity, it becomes toxic and it becomes dehumanizing. Toxic shame is unbearable and it always, always forces us to cover up, to hide, to wear masks, or even create a false version of ourself. This result is a lifetime of cover up and secrecy. In his book, The Cure, 
John Lynch puts it this way. He says, no one told me this two-faced, this false self life would severely stunt my growth or that it would break my heart. No matter how many titles or accolades I accumulate, I remain wounded and immature, long on success, but short on dreams and substance. I admire people who live the true face life, but my loss of hope forces me to scramble for safety from behind a mask. The cost is horrific. He goes on to say it this way. He says, no one told me that when I wear a mask, only my mask receives love. We gain admiration and respect from behind a mask. We can even uh, intimidate. But as long as we're behind a mask, any mask, we will not be able to receive love. Then, in our desperation to be loved, we'll rush to fashion more masks, hoping the next will give us what we're longing for. To be known, accepted, trusted, and loved. In 2012, Christopher Nolan, uh, director, released uh, the second of the Batman series uh, called The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, And in this movie, um, Bruce Wayne goes to this gala. It's a mask gala, so everybody's kind of got a mask on. And all of a sudden, he's he's dancing with Selina, who ends up being Catwoman. And in this scene, uh, she asks him this question. She says, who are you pretending to be? He's the only one without a mask. Who are you pretending to be? He replies, Bruce Wayne, eccentric billionaire. Now here's what's interesting. Christopher Nolan in an interview said that the reason that that scene was such a big deal for him is that he wanted to communicate that because of of Bruce Wayne's childhood trauma and deep-seated shame that Bruce considers Batman his true identity and, and Bruce Wayne is the disguise, the mask that he wears in public. What? And the truth, like, I just, like how often Like we find ourselves constantly performing, constantly pretending. We walk away from social interactions and we replay every conversation. Did I say too much? Did I say not enough? Was that too funny? Was that not funny enough? Like, oh, I should have done this or I should have done this. I shouldn't have ordered that. I should like, and we just play this cycle. It just goes over and over our mind. And listen, that comes from the lie and the shame that whispers to your heart that you are defective, that you are are not enough. In his book, The Psychology of Shame, clinical psychologist, author Gershon Kaufman, he communicates this. Don't miss this, this is wild. He says that secrets and hiding are the basic cause of suffering for all of us. Okay, and then he goes on and he says this, shame is the source of many complex and disturbing inner states. It's Shame is the cause of depression, alienation, self-doubt, isolating loneliness, paranoid, schizoid phenomenon, compulsive disorders, splitting of the self, perfectionism, a deep sense of inferiority, inadequacy or failure, the so-called borderline conditions and disorders of narcissism. All because of shame. Brene Brown an American researcher on the topics, like, I mean, she focuses on shame and vulnerability. She says it this way. She said, shame is in a wide range of mental and public health issues, including self-esteem issues, um, depression, addiction, eating disorders, bullying, suicide, family violence, and sexual assault. Shame is at the center of mental illness, character disorders, and violence. So, Adam and Eve, eyes are opened and shame comes crashing in. And how do they respond? Look at chapter three, verse seven. It says, then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Fig leaves. 
like fig leaves, like really. But the fig leaves, watch this, are the world's first attempt to control and cover up shame. It's the first mask we ever put on. And since that day, we've never managed to stop feeling the need to do the exact same thing. Adam and Eve reached for fig leaves and the rest of the world became a fashion show. Now today, our fig leaves are just a little bit more sophisticated. We have designer options now. The fig leaves of being an academic, that of being an athlete, an artist, a musician, joining a sorority or fraternity, The Genesis story calls this disastrous exchange for security, for shame, as fig leaves. And we've all been doing the exact same thing ever since. So tonight, maybe I can pose it this way. And you don't have to say anything out loud, but what are your fig leaves? Because you have them. And I'll even say this, if you don't know, or you responded, or I would say this way, if you responded with, ah, Drew, I don't have any fig leaves, that communicates how deep and hidden your shame goes. That just like Batman, you've lost which is the real you and which is not. The mask has become such a part of you The fig leaves are so integrated that you can't tell yourself and the fig leaves apart. What are your fig leaves? The Bible says that once mankind took life into their own hands and chose not to trust God, their eyes are open, they realize they're naked, so they grab fig leaves to cover their bodies. Then what happens? Take a look, verse 8. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. So they cover themselves in shame. They isolate themselves by running and hiding. Okay. Now this is, um, I don't think we have a picture of my daughter. So I've got two kiddos. I've got a three and a half year old named Matilda and we call her Tilly. And then I have a one year old son named Lyndon. And um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we were kind of getting ready for bed and uh, Tilly's brushing her teeth and I hear something kind of crash in the upstairs bathroom. And so I thought something broke, so I kind of rush in and it's like empty, like there's like something on the ground and I can't find my daughter. And I kind of pull back the shower curtain and I see her just hiding, just hiding. And it was such an interesting moment to just go, how quickly how quickly shame and hiding enters into their little stories. How quickly. And, I, and my wife and I love each other really well. I would say we're, you know, above dysfunctional, you know, and we're doing okay. My daughter has no reason to hide. But yet it's inside of her. So next in the story, God comes looking here for his walking buddies and the cool of the day and he can't find them. And in verse nine, look at it. God's response is, where are you? Like God comes to them and he asks a question, where, where are you? Once again, that's, that's weird, right? Does God not really know where they are? Is God confused? Where are you? Now, This is interesting, fun little sidebar. There are actually two Hebrew words for the word where, or the question, where are you, okay? Uh, There's one uh, that's like, um, like where is the thing? Like if it's like, hey, uh, where where did I put my keys? I can't can't remember, you got it? Um, That could be anywhere, I'm not sure, I don't remember. The second one um, has more to do with assuming something is where it's supposed to be. Like, hey, where are my keys? They were right here. This is where I left them. They're not where they're supposed to be. Does that make sense? Is that you tracking? Why that's important is because what God is saying here, it's the second. Like Adam, Eve, like you're not, you're not where you're supposed to be. 
You're supposed to be walking with me in the garden. You're supposed to be by my side. Adam, Eve, you're not where you're supposed to be. Where are you? God's question is an invitation into intimacy. Where'd you go? That's not, you're supposed to be right here. Where'd you go? Tonight, maybe that's all some of you needed to hear. That the Father is drawing near and he's asking many of you the question tonight. Where are you? Where are you, my son? Where where are you, my daughter? Where are you? Be honest with me. Where are you? Stop pretending. Stop hiding. Where are you? And look at Adam's response. Verse 10. So weird. He says this. And he said, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid. Of all the things that Adam could have said, all the things that he could tell God right now, why does he focus on the nakedness? Once again, this story is dripping wet with the shame of humanity. And shame always destroys intimacy. Always. With God and with others. Then, look at this. Of all the things that God could have said, like he could have focused on the tree or the rebellion, but instead his first words in verse 11 are this. Who told you that you were naked? What? Once again, so weird. This nakedness theme that just keeps getting brought up over and over again. But the question, God's question is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. God says, who told you that you were naked? And I love the question because they were naked the whole time. And it wasn't a problem. I I think many of us, and I love what, the Patrick, the way he set up this whole song, we have this tendency to project onto God some type of tone to his question. That was, he's really mad and disappointed. Because what of us, a lot of us living in shame assume that's God's response to us. That he's frustrated, he's holding out, he's just backing up, arms crossed, waiting for you to get your act together. Just perpetually disappointed in you. But I love that the question, because it shows the heart of God and that the heart is broken. Who told you you were naked, Adam? What what voices are you listening to? Adam, I, I created you naked. I told you that you were good and beautiful and lovely. And now all of a sudden you're ashamed of the very way that I created you? Like what other voices are you listening to? Like we we walk around with so much shame of who we are. And I wonder if God asked the question of us tonight, why are you ashamed of the very way that I created you? Who told you that you were naked? Why is being completely secure in who I've created you to be and who I am in you? Why is all of a sudden that an issue? What voices are you listening to? The invitation for us is to not listen to other voices, especially those in our head that tell us to be ashamed of the person that we are. Because the person that is sitting in your chair here in Reed Arena, don't miss this, was personally created by God, made in his image, loved, valued and accepted. And he invites you to rest in that. That he pulls us close and whispers to so many of us, I love you, I treasure you. Don't listen to these voices. Trust that you are seen and loved right where you are. Not some future version of yourself once you get it all figured out. Be fine in your nakedness. What's also interesting is when they realized they were naked... They sewed the fig leaves together and they cover themselves, but yet they're still ashamed. They try to fix the problem and it doesn't work. And I want you to think about this. 
I love that God doesn't respond to them in their nakedness by saying, uh, like try to fix their misconceptions. Like he could have just been like, guys, like quit, quit being so dumb. Nakedness is totally fine. It's cool. Like you're just thinking about it all wrong. Stop thinking that way. Think more positive thoughts. No. Instead, he meets them right where they are in their shame. And he sews them clothes. Like I love that. I love the fact that God hears our shame. He sees our shame and in love, he graciously comforts us. Even though I think in reality, he, gosh, it could have just been like us. Like, but he meets us right where we are and he makes clothes for them. He covers them. How? And this is really good and really sweet. Genesis 3.21 says this. The Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife and he clothed them. Something had to die here. Blood was shed so that they could be covered. In literature, we call it foreshadowing. God is telegraphing the end of the story where our shame and our wounds do not have the last word and Christ will be victorious. In the opening pages of the Bible, we see this tragic effects of sin. After eating from the tree, God said not to. Adam and Eve hide behind a different tree, naked and conquered by shame. And this has been the story of humanity throughout ages, but it doesn't end there. In Jesus, there's this new humanity that's offered, one not shackled by the prison of sin and shame, but liberated into the fullness and the freedom of God's love. And that singular act involving that tree in the Garden of Eden, the world was sent into a disastrous tailspin of sin and shame. But then Jesus came and in one act of obedience forever changed the trajectory of our world. Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, was willing to die so that his bloodshed could cover us and end our shame. Yes, Adam and Eve hid behind a tree, naked and conquered by shame, but Jesus hung on a tree, naked and conquered shame. And this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus, shame does not have the last word in your life. We get, we are invited into living in freedom that comes in his name. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no shame for those in Christ Jesus. I'll kind of close with this tonight. A couple of months ago, um, I flew to the middle of nowhere, Georgia, and um, got away for just a few days and just did an extensive, like, kind of soul searching. There's a counselor, like, it was just deep, deep work. And it brought up like a lot in my life and some of the stuff I was kind of aware of and it just like went another layer deeper. And like this shame, like this like, this tension that I, I constantly walking in believing that God, like he needs me, but he doesn't really desire me. He doesn't love me. And so I get up here and I perform and I get off stage and I go, God, did I make you happy? Did you smile? And people would say things like, Drew, just relax. God loves you. I was like, no, like big deal. Like, big deal. Like, God loves everybody. That doesn't make me special. I got to work for it. Because that's what my dad taught me. And so all of a sudden, we're doing, we're pulling out all of this shame. And because honestly, man, I don't, I don't, I don't want to live like this. I want, I want healing. And just as a side note, Maybe somebody needs to hear this tonight. I I learned in this journey that that what you do not let God transform in your life, you will just transfer it to your kids. Because I watched deep toxic shame of my grandparents and they couldn't deal with it. So I just handed it to my parents. My parents were like, I don't know what to do with this. So Drew, you carry it for a while. And if I don't let it, let God transform, it's only a matter of time before I take it. And I go, Tilly, Lyndon, it's yours now. But by the grace of God, I'm going to do the hard work. 
so it dies with me. And my kids don't have to carry the shame that I've carried for the last 30 plus years. And there's a moment in this counseling process where I, I, I hadn't really put two and two together, but all of a sudden I think I tell this story about like when I was a kid, like so often, this happens so often, that the moments that I felt like the conflict in, in our family or I felt unloved, I would literally leave the house. I would go outside and I would climb up a tree and I would hang out and hide in this tree until someone came out looking for me. So like six, seven, eight year old Drew, like in a tree, sometimes for hours until someone like, would come and maybe call out my name and then they'd go inside and then I'd kind of shimmy down and the whole time just going, does anybody care? Like, is anybody gonna come look for me? Did anybody even notice I was gone? And so as we're talking and we're working through this, this, this piece and I'm just letting the Lord heal some stuff and um, the counselor kind of towards the end, it's like, I'm like packing up and he's like, hey Drew, I think you need to let God redeem that tree story for you. I was like, ah, what do you mean? He's like, you see that big tree right there? I think as we go inside, I think you need to take some time with the Lord and you climb up it and let, it, let him redeem it. Let him show you that he meets you there. Let him redeem the story so that you realize that at that height, you get new vantage points and new vision. Maybe God wants you to let, like, redeem that part so that you could come down and then, and then and maybe you might be able to help other people and you come to be like, hey, you can come down. It's, it's safe, it's safe. You, you can come out of hiding. Like, I, I know, I know you're scared to death and I know you're worried. I know you think everyone's gonna turn their back on you, but, but I'm learning it's safe down here. And so I, I ended up, I did it, I climbed a tree. Um, I think we might even have a picture of, uh, yeah, I think there's the, you can circle it. Um, uh, and yeah, there I am, if you couldn't see me. And then I took a selfie, because what else are you gonna do? Um, but I was so reminded, even this morning, of Luke 19, in the story of Zacchaeus. And you know, many people kind of philosophize, like why did he climb up the tree? Was it because he was short? I honestly think it was because Zacchaeus dealt with deep heart shame because of his occupation and his lifestyle before. And he just wanted to be isolated from the crowds. And I love Jesus's response to Zacchaeus and all of his shame, and all of his insecurity, all of his blemishes, and Zacchaeus, like he walks up to him and he says, Zacchaeus, I see you. Like I see you and I love you and I'm asking you to do something really brave. Come down the tree. Why? Because today, today we have lunch plans and I love you. And I don't want you to spend your life hiding and wearing masks and pretending to be something that maybe somehow, some way you'll gain the love and acceptance and belonging that your heart is desperately looking for. So break away. How do, how do we do this? How do we walk in this freedom that Christ paid for on the cross? One, you focus on Jesus, not on yourself. You fix your eyes on the author and the perfecter of your faith, not on yourself. If you leave this place and you think that you're just going to try harder, work harder, then you're giving in to the shame. And you're not giving in to the finished work of the cross. You keep your eyes on Jesus. We learn to trust his goodness and you learn to trust how he sees you. You let his voice be the voice that speaks into your identity, not the things you do or you produce or how others see you. You let him tell you because he knows best like who knows you better than Jesus? So let, let him speak to your heart. Let him tell you who you are. And then lastly, 
you come down the tree. You focus on honesty and not hiding. As your older brother is just a half a step ahead of you. It's safe. You can come down. He really does love you. And he really is inviting you into deeper waters than you ever knew imaginable. But the chains of toxic shame, sadly, will keep many of you in this room in a prison that Jesus died to set you free from. So, if it's cool, I'd love to just give you 120 seconds, it's like two minutes. Right where you are, would you just wrestle? God, what are you saying to me? Like, what's he speaking to your heart? And then how do you get to respond to that? Like, how, how, what's he inviting you into? Not like, not what do you have to do? Not, not how do you have to perform? Like, don't try to like get more religious fig leaves and try to work harder. No, 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 you missed it. How do you get to live? What's he inviting you into? Or maybe you just need to be so honest tonight and wrestle with the question, where are you hiding? Where are you, where are you hiding? What's, what's your tree? And what would it look like to be honest? This is your time. You sit with Jesus and then we'll worship.